Welcome to the Cook the Books podcast by Tea with Coffee Media. I'm Tyler Wachkowski, the president and publisher of Tea with Coffee Media. And I'm Kelsey Ann Lovelady, the vice president of marketing. Back in 2021, we took our experience as independent authors and used it to create a publishing company with our friends. Our mission is to help other indie authors reach more and greater success. This podcast is dedicated to helping authors find the perfect recipe to create their books and their persona as an author. We talk about everything from plotting to character creation to marketing to using your life experiences to create your unique voice and stories. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Cook the Books podcast, where I am one of your hosts, Tyler Witkowski, who is also bipolar, has borderline personality disorder, anxiety, and depression, and PTSD. And this is my best friend, Kelsey Ann Lovelady, who has autism, self-diagnosed ADHD, an adjustment disorder with depression, bipolar disorder with anxiety, and PTSD. And you're probably wondering, why are they telling us all this? Because today's topic main topic is going to be mental health on and off the page and we are super excited anybody who knows me knows i'm a huge mental health advocate um but first off kelsey how are you doing i'm doing all right you know things are finally everything with my new job they finally have everything working so i'm no longer being paid to do nothing every single day boo for me but hey it's paycheck week so (laughs) Who's going to complain? There, there you go. That's the important thing. You know, I, I'm i doing pretty good. You know, my contracts are uh, doing well. I'm staying on top of them, running the company. And, you know, it's just been a great time. But uh, you know what's not a great time? Mm. Paying for reviewers, which is our hot topic for the day. So let's jump right into it. Kelsey, What? Uh, why don't you start off by... Well, I'll introduce the hot topic a little bit more. So yeah, you're the on one who threads, told me about it. Yeah. So on Threads, there is a, a huge debate right now about whether authors should be paying book reviewers for their time. Um, and there was a reader who was probably a reviewer who put out this um, statement on Threads and basically said, you know, if you're author you need to be paying reviewers because they're content creators to blah 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 my personal view is look i love reviewers reviewers are great but there are so many places where you can get reviewers for free um you know why would you pay for one but number two it's also unethical right it's highly unethical and amazon will crack down on you if they start noticing that you're paying reviewers I understand where this book reviewer might be coming from. Like, hey, I'm taking time out of my day to review this book and my review could make or break this person's sales. I get that. The exchange for you reviewing the book is you get a free copy of the book. Either ebook or paperback. That's That's your payback. And that's always been the understanding of what the payback is. And a lot of the times you'll see if you get a book reviewer gets a physical book, they get a PR package that has a whole bunch of stuff in it. Um, Now, there is a little bit of a difference in paying for promotion like um, cover reveals and book tour, blog tours, things like that. But paying for reviewers, I mean, you touched a little bit on the potential consequences, but I mean, how does it affect the integrity of the literary world? Well, for one thing, we have no idea if this book reviewer is saying positive things because the author paid them. And sometimes reviewers kind of charge astronomically for their time to review a book, which again, I understand they're taking time out of their personal day to do this. But if you're doing it because not because you love it but because you want to try to make money off of it you're in the wrong you're in the wrong kind of situation if you want it like you said there's a difference between promoting a book and reviewing a book we 
promote authors, even those who don't publish with us. We have marketing services. We can create mock-ups for them. At no point do we say one way or the other whether or not the book is good. And, you know, one thing that we do at Tea with Coffee Media uh, is the Tea with Coffee Club. We don't pay our reviewers, but for every three books they read and review and leave an, on an honest review, um, they get a uh, swag from our shop which is no different than sending a pr package yeah. um and you know one thing we've had some reviewers that have left us one or two star reviews and those reviews still count i mean you know they are honest reviews and that's what we're asking for and we appreciate all of our reviewers and that's why you know there there is a good point about wanting to reward your uh your reviewers but there's other ways you can reward them besides monetary compensation because it is unethical and it is sways the results and it is against a lot of terms and policies for some of these review sites like goodreads and um Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I mean, they have policies against this kind of thing. What? Uh, I mean, I mean, Kelsey, how can we create a more transparent and fair literary community that values the authenticity of the writing and discourages unethical practices like paying for a book review? Well, I think the first thing is to kind of break down the idea of hustle culture, where you have to monetize literally everything you do. You're allowed to have a hobby you don't make money from. If you happen to be a reviewer who likes books and people listen to you because you have good opinions, you don't necessarily need to get paid for that. You can get paid other ways. Like if you want to, if you're that popular of a book reviewer, start a damn YouTube channel. You will be able to get your subscribers quickly so that you can start monetizing your videos without having to charge for your book reviews. Or you can set up a Patreon. You have other options, but understand not everything you do has to be something that makes you money. And I think it's the idea of hustle culture and capitalism that is leading to this. And, yeah. you know, we've we've seen it in many different ways. Like people are trying to monetize everything. Mukbangs, you're, you're paying, you're being paid to eat food. There are people on TikTok who they set up a control board in their room and they let their TikTok live viewers completely control the lights the sounds everything that's in their bedroom while they sleep now you're monetizing sleep not everything needs to make you money i understand that we would love to have a job that we where we just get to do our hobby or we just get to do what we love without having to work the nine to five grind but you're allowed to have a hobby that doesn't make you money and it's healthier that way honestly yeah, because when you're making money from a hobby, the enjoyment from that hobby kind of goes out the window, right? I mean, you know, you you start to want to do, make more, and, you know, every goal you set doesn't lead to freedom because you just set another one that you're going to keep shooting for. And it's it's very disheartening whenever you can't meet those, and then you get burnt out from doing your hobby, and it's just, it's rough. Yeah. And I, I think that we need to look at book reviews again, like stop looking this at this as you're doing a favor for the author. Look at this as you're doing something that is making you a good time, that you get enjoyment out of, and you're telling people your opinions. That's it. That's what book reviewing is. Right. So Kelsey, as our vice president of marketing, let me ask you this. Are there any alternative ways for authors to gain exposures, receive feedback, get reviews um, on their work without resorting to paying for reviewers? Yes. Rather than paying the reviewers themselves, there are sites that you can pay that allow you access to the reviewers. We use Pubby, we use Booksprout, we use Book Sirens. And we're not paying the reviewers we're paying the website the ability to talk to the reviewers. They get to choose whether or not they review our book and they leave honest reviews. We don't pressure them one way or another and we don't incentivize them one way or another. Right. 
And another great program that uh, we've utilized in the past is NetGalley um, and Indie Reader. Both of those are um, very good resources. And none of that is against Amazon's or any of these other services, terms, and policies. They're completely legal, ethical, and, you know, that that's the greatest thing about them is, you know, you could pay a reviewer, each reviewer, 50 bucks, or you could pay 50 bucks a month to get access to unlimited reviewers. I mean, let's weigh out the opportunities here and see, because, you know, I don't know. Um, but Kelsey, let's, uh, let's jump to a break real quick. And then let's okay. come back into the main topic, because the main topic is going to be a good one today. Yes, it is. And one that we both can speak heavily on. Yes, ma'am. All right. And we will be back shortly after this quick word. Welcome back to the Cook the Books podcast, where I am one of your hosts, Tyler Witkowski, who is also bipolar, has borderline personality disorder, anxiety, and depression, and PTSD. And this is my best friend, Kelsey Ann Lovell Lady, who has autism, self-diagnosed ADHD, an adjustment disorder with depression, bipolar disorder with anxiety, and PTSD. And you're probably wondering, why are they telling us all this? Because today's topic, main topic, is going to be mental health on and off the page, and we are super excited. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a huge mental health advocate. Um, but first off, Kelsey, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, things are finally, everything with my new job, they finally have everything working. So I'm no longer being paid to do nothing every single day. Boo for me. But hey, it's paycheck week. So who's going to complain? There you, there you go. That's the important thing. You know, I, I'm i doing pretty good. You know, my contracts are uh, doing well. I'm staying on top of them, running the company. And, you know, it's just been a great time. But uh you know what's not a great time? Mm. Paying for reviewers, which is our hot topic for the day. So let's jump right into it. Kelsey, What? Uh, why don't you start off by, well, I, I'll introduce the hot topic a little bit more. So yeah, you're the on one who threads, told me about it. Yeah. So on threads, there is a, a huge debate right now about whether authors should be paying book reviewers for their time. Um, and... There was a reader who was probably a reviewer who put out this um, statement on threads and basically said, you know, if you're an author, you need to be paying reviewers because they're content creators to blah, 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 blah. My personal view is, look, I love reviewers. Reviewers are great. But there are so many places where you can get reviewers for free. Um, you know, why would you pay for one? But number two... It's also unethical, right? It's highly unethical, and Amazon will crack down on you if they start noticing that you're paying reviewers. I understand where this book reviewer might be coming from. Like, hey, I'm taking time out of my day to review this book, and my review could make or break this person's sales. I get that. The exchange for you reviewing the book is you get a free copy of the book either ebook right. or paperback that's your that's your payback and that's always been the understanding of what the payback is and a lot of the times you'll see if you get a book reviewer gets a physical book they get a pr package that has a whole bunch of stuff in it um now there is a little bit of a difference in paying for promotion like um cover reveals and book tour blog tours things like that but paying for reviewers i mean you touched a little bit on the potential consequences but i mean how does it affect the integrity of the literary world well for one thing we have no idea if this book reviewer is saying positive things because the author paid them and sometimes reviewers kind of charge astronomically for their time to review a book, which again, I understand they're taking time out of their personal day to do this. But if you're doing it, because not because you love it, but because you want to try to make money off of it, you're in the wrong 
you're in the wrong kind of situation. If you want, it, like you said, there's a difference between promoting a book and reviewing a book. We promote authors, even those who don't publish with us. We have marketing services. We can create mock-ups for them. At no point do we say one way or the other whether or not the book is good. And, you know, one thing that we do at Tea with Coffee Media uh, is the Tea with Coffee Club. We don't pay our reviewers, but for every three books they read and review and leave an on an honest review, um, they get a swag from our shop, which is no different than sending a PR package. Um, yeah. And, you know, one thing we've had some reviewers that have left us one or two star reviews and those reviews still count. I mean, you know, they are honest reviews and that's what we're asking for. And we appreciate all of our reviewers. And that's why, you know, there there is a good point about wanting to reward your uh, your reviewers, but there's other ways you can reward them besides monetary compensation because it is unethical and it is sways the results. And it is against a lot of terms and policies for some of these review sites like Goodreads and um Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I mean, they have policies against this kind of thing. What uh I mean, I mean, Kelsey, how can we create a more transparent and fair literary community? Hey everybody, my name is Tyler Witkowski. I am the publisher and founder of Tea with Coffee Media. I can't believe I did this! I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this! <laughs> I am a nine-year Navy vet. <clears throat> the Navy kind of uh, broke me in the process, so I, I am a disabled vet as well. Games like The Sims or Skyrim, making my character and putting them in this world and seeing how they would traverse this stuff. And I, today, am signing a contract with Tea with Coffee Media. friends soon you won't have any what are you a fortune cookie and we are back and we are ready for this discussion aren't we kelsey yes we are this is an important discussion one that i think we've been looking forward to yes um let, let's dive right in kelsey so how does your mental health, I mean, you, you talked about your mental health um, issues earlier, and I'm sure there are a ton of people out there who can relate just like they can relate to me. So how does mental health impact the writing process for you? And how does it create authentic characters? Well, I guess the way that my mental health impacts my writing is because I am neurodivergent in multiple different ways. I can pretty much guarantee you that every main character I write is neurodivergent because that is the only experience I understand. I don't know what it's like to be neurotypical in the world and understand these weird social constructs that I still don't get. So, and then, especially in the case of one, what I would view as kind of like my magnum opus, Indifferent, which was all about my mental health and especially mental health post breakup it's it, it has to be a main focus of everything it has to be the thing that you look at the most and evaluate the most um yeah I think that's where my mental health really impacts me as a writer is I'm always going to write the neurodivergent or mental health experience because that's all I know yeah, and I, I think for me, the biggest way it impacts my writing, and I think this actually is a point for you too, but 
I have to have some kind of sensory um, environment around me, whether it's music or something for me to touch and play with or um, a candle for me to smell or a certain drink or, you know, for me, alcohol, but, you know, or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, uh, it, it really, I think the sensory thing is a huge mental health thing. Uh, a lot of people with mental illness talk about how they are more prone to sensory things, um, sensory therapy, as I like to call it. Uh, that's one thing I actually taught my therapist that was sensory therapy, which fun fact. Um, <laughs> but what I do is I, I, I embrace the senses and use those as a way to relax myself and calm myself and get myself in the zone. And it helps me to create authentic characters because I know the experiences of what it's like to be mentally ill. I know, like you said, the not being neurotypical, how to, how we see the world. And, you know, my, my favorite, my baby is not alone. And I just re-released it this month. And one of the biggest things about that for me was it was based on true events in my life. And I wanted to show other people that they didn't have to feel alone, that there was hope that, they could achieve success despite what they see as their flaws. Exactly. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about your personal experiences, maybe a particular time where your mental health as a writer has um, really impacted you and your writing process or your work? So, yeah, like the one, the story that I like to tell the most is when I was writing my murder mystery, permanent reminders, now, the main character, Jazz, has PTSD from an event from her past. And our friend, Caitlin, was my beta reader for that book. Caitlin also has PTSD from, uh, from moments in her past. And I wrote PTSD the way that it was always depicted in movies because I was sure at the time I didn't have PTSD. But Caitlin explained to me that PTSD doesn't always look the way that it does in Hollywood. It's not the it's not the guy remembering Vietnam as, you know, there's ringing static in his ear. Not always. It's not always like that. And as she explained, like, how PTSD can manifest and what does it look like, I was thinking to myself, hmm, okay. I asked her, like, Okay, so what about flipping off the the nasty thoughts that come up in your brain? And she said, yeah, I fully say fuck you to my bad thoughts sometimes. The reason why I asked about that is because I do it. Every time that weird little memory of embarrassment from elementary school comes up, I'm just like, you think I would have gotten the hint that I have PTSD, but nope. I was just like, huh. Weird thing. Weird coincidence. Yeah. Um, and you actually taught me that to name um our demons within us and tell them to shut up and flip them off and leave me alone. I mean, I, I've got a demon that's named Kevin. I can't say the oh yeah, I can't say that. Yeah, his name is Kevin. It. His name is Kevin the bitch. And <laughs> all the time. Kelsey, whenever I'm having a, a down moment or imposter syndrome, she's like, tell Kevin the bitch to fuck off. And I'm like, yes, I will. And it makes me feel better. Um, but I, I, learned, I think one of I learned ahead, that Kelsey. from I learned that from Caitlin and Shannon too. My inner demon is named Ambrose. Because when I hear the name Ambrose, what I hear is what I see is a stuffy general from shall I say, the losing side of the Civil War. And that's definitely the type of person I want to say shut the fuck up to. Yeah. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest personal experiences that shaped my writing was writing Not Alone because, you know, much like you, I didn't find out I had PTSD until earlier this year. And um, so I didn't really know what was going on at the time, but I was writing Not Alone, and some of these scenes were just so, they brought me back to that time, and I started having flashbacks and powerful moments that made my chest feel like it was constricting, and 
So it, it made it hard to write sometimes because I was so afraid of going back to that feeling, but I pushed through because I knew I needed to tell my story to my friends and family because at first I was never going to publish and they all told me I should publish. Um, but I, I think it's influenced my work too because I, I try to incorporate mental health in all my work. You know, Not Alone obviously is about mental health. Um, Coffee, Alcohol, and Heartbreak, my poetry collection was written during my darkest battles of mental health. The Seeds of Love is about a mentally ill young man who falls in love. And then Potent, which you and I just wrote, um, I, I wrote Obi as a schizophrenic. And we're writing Time and Tide, which we've mentioned on the podcast before, our Blackbeard and Anne Boney reimagining. And Blackbeard has PTSD. And, you know, we, we've we really, I really tried to incorporate some kind of P, or some kind of mental illness in all of my writing so that I can make people feel like, hey, that's me. And, you know, like with Obi, he's the king of the fairies. And he's still got a mental illness when he comes out into this world. It's it's not just because of you. Even the gods can have a mental illness. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I kind of touched on this and I'll, I'll take this one, but in what ways does an author's mental well-being contribute to the overall quality of their writing? And for me, it's it's all, again, it goes back to that sensory therapy. You've got to be in the right headspace to be able to write because if you're in that negative headspace, if you're facing that imposter syndrome, you're going to write the same thing 20 different times, 20 different ways and delete it every single time because you think it's stupid at the end of the day. And you know, that's what imposter syndrome, that's what mental illness does to you. It makes you feel like you're a lesser person, but that's just Kevin the bitch lying to you or Ambrose yeah. lying to you, you know? Um, so for you, Kelsey, I mean, what ways does your mental well-being contribute to the overall quality of your writing? Oh, Lord. Um, obviously, the imposter syndrome, always going, you're not good enough. You never will be good enough. There's also a little bit of, obviously, with bipolar disorder, with anxiety, I have highs and I have lows. And the highs are when I'm manic. And often that comes around when I get a new book idea, which is why I will jump from book idea to book idea to book idea and never necessarily finish one. It takes a lot of, like, buckling down for, and me going okay, time to focus on something. Otherwise, nothing's going to get done because we have hundreds of book ideas. I'd like 25% of them to be done by the time I die. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, what steps can writers like us take to prioritize their mental health and maintain a healthy uh, work-life balance, which is something you and I both talk about a lot is a work-life balance. In fact, I think you just mentioned it today to me. Yeah. And I, my advice is what I brought up earlier when we were talking about paying for book reviews. Hustle culture is going to hurt you in the long run. Yes, the ultimate goal is that you make enough money from your writing that that can be your full-time job and you never have to work for corporate America again. Yes, but you cannot do nothing but work and write and work and write for years on end without there being some kind of repercussion. You are gonna get burnt out. Be patient with yourself and don't, and the other thing is stop comparing yourself. Stop comparing yourself to those around you. Oh, this person got published when they were 17. Okay, so you're not them. You have a different path. Comparison is the thief of joy. It steals joy from you in your accomplishments and it steals joy from the person you're comparing yourself to because it greatly dwindles. It, it completely like disregards the hard work that person put in in order to get the accomplishments they have. Run your own race, I believe, is the phrase from the show Bluey. So you brought up a very good point that got me thinking. Um, when writers start writing for money, do they lose the authenticity of their writing? No, 
necessarily. I mean, I've I'm not made, you know, Aragorn Aragon money by my writing by any means, like Christopher Polini or Patrick Rothfuss. I've not made that money. But I have made money and I still will never write a book just because oh, this is what the market demands right now. This is what people are paying money for. I'm going to write whatever I damn well write. I got to enjoy my process and I've got to enjoy my story if I'm going to do it. At the end of the day, I'm only going to write what I enjoy. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like when you start writing for audiences that aren't yours or you start writing whatever's selling at the time, uh, you you kind of lose some authenticity of your writing, don't you? Because you've got a certain point where, like you said, you still you want to make money and you still make money, but you're writing what you enjoy. You're writing whatever the hell you want to write. But when you start writing what other people want to see, you, you don't you lose a little bit of that that authenticity of your of who you are as a writer. You lose the authenticity and people are going to catch on. You're, you're, it's going to be obvious that you're writing this not because you enjoy it, but because market demands it. It's, it is abundantly obvious when people create something for money, not for joy. I was a musical theater major. And I had to take musical theater history. And we had an entire day dedicated to musical flops. And one of the major reasons why a musical will flop is because it is producer created. Producers are the money bags. They give the people money. The problem with that is if they try to create the musical themselves, they're thinking about money, not logistics, not joy, not story. So there are two musicals that stick out in my mind. The first is, uh, I believe it was called Bring in the Music, Bring in the Funk. A producer saw the incredible success of In the Heights, the rap musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda, and said, let's make a Tupac musical. It did not go well. Another, pers another person saw the success of all of Andrew Lloyd Webber's work, specifically Phantom of the Opera. Okay, let's let's create a musical called Dance of the Vampire King. Let's have a big staircase sing, just like in Masquerade. And let's have everybody singing Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler. It did not go well. And of course, everybody in the musical theater world understands the incredible shame that was Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. That was also a producer idea story. It didn't work. It's abundantly up. And we see it in movies too. If you look at the movie theater and see all the movies that are there, you can tell which ones were made because the producer said, yes, money, I want money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Kels, how can writers ensure that they're like actually portraying mental health issues without perpetuating stereotypes or stigmatizing individuals? If an author themselves has a mental issue, mental health issue that they are writing into the book, just be honest, right? Write your experience honestly like what I had to do for permanent reminders. Talk honestly about what PTSD is like for me. If you're writing a mental health issue that you yourself have not experienced, actually do your research in what it actually means to have that mental health disorder. Don't just look up the symptoms on WebMD. Actually look for conversations from people who have that mental health disorder. Yeah, there's a great resource out there that I love called The Mighty, and they're mental illness stories from all kinds of people. I used to write for them. They're an online magazine. Um, I've still got a couple of stories published on their website, and it's a great way to read the resources because it tells you what the stigmas are, what the stereotypes are. One article I wrote is about words that you shouldn't use because it, it's stigmatizing. 
um, exactly. words like crazy and uh, using bipolar as an adjective and using anxiety as an adjective, you know, it, it can trigger people when they hear their, it sends them into a panic and, you know, being able to do that research, but interview people. Like if you know somebody who is mentally ill, say, Hey, I'm writing this story and I'd really like to get some feedback. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about what your experience is or sensitivity readers? Sensitivity readers are also a wonderful resource because they go through and they say, Hey, this, this isn't exactly how, you know, kind of like what Caitlin did for you and a little bit like uh, what our editor, Sarah Sanders, who will be on our next episode of C the Cookbooks podcast. Um, she did for me whenever she was editing my book. She kind of did a sensitivity read over it. Uh, even though I am mentally ill and it was based on true experiences, it's not always a bad idea to get some feedback. Um, exactly. So, Kels, I got... I got one more question for you. No, two more questions. I'm gonna break this. I'm gonna break this into two questions. Okay. First is how can readers promote and support the mental health of writers? Boy, there's a question. Um yeah. First of all, just understand that they're human, same as everybody else. Obviously, like call them out if they're encouraging shitty very humans. hard if they're shitty humans or they're encouraging not okay things but also understand they themselves are human like we we previously talked about katie roberts who very prolific uh erotica writer and she was churning out the books at one time she burned herself out and she needed to take a break and she's still churning out a lot of books just not as fast as she was and she was actually she actually took a kind of side project for herself a passion project which was just fan fiction and she actually had some of her fan base saying why are you working on fan fiction work on the books that you actually that will actually make you money like no we've talked about this have a hobby that doesn't make you money it's okay right. you need something you need something that keeps you firmly on the ground and not just breaking your back for money. Right. All right. Second part of the question. How can other writers support each other or support each other and promote the mental health of other writers? Poppy cut paste exactly what i said so just yeah also also understand that they're human call out bad behavior when you see it yeah but also understand no one can work 24 hours a day seven days a week those who try often do serious damage to themselves yeah i'm looking at you <laughs> I, I think I'm changing the subject and answering the question. <laughs> of course, you, of course you are, Mister. Uh, yeah. Um. I I think for me the biggest way is by supporting them. Um. And that that's not necessarily monetary support. And of like you said, if they're shitty human beings or you know, and, and I'm not saying by leaving them positive reviews on every single book, but. You know, if you read a book that you like by the writer, leave a review. If you see some of their content that you like on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, like it, share it, post it to your story. Um, leave them reviews on businesses, small businesses, leave reviews on small businesses, post testimonials if you've actually bought something. Um, you know, there are so many ways that you can freely support authors and writers and small businesses that it doesn't always have to do with money. And if you've got the money and you want to support your writer, buy their book. It makes them feel good. Shoot them, uh, you know, maybe not a DM, but post on their Facebook wall or send them uh, or tag them in a tweet and say, hey, I just got this book. I'm so excited to read it. Um, and after you read it, tell them how, how good it was. Tell them how much it meant to you if it was something that was passionate. You know, support doesn't always come with money and that's okay. It doesn't make it any less of support just because you're not spending money on it. In fact, 
I, I would rather have 20 people share something that I post about my book than 20 people buy my book. Because if each of those people share my book on social media, then they could get another five people to buy it. And then I'm selling a hundred copies. Exactly. So Kels, uh, I think that's going to bring us to the end of our conversation today. It was a very powerful conversation. I think, you know, our audience is going to walk away with a lot from this. Um, do you have any last words on uh, how about how authors maintain their mental health or how you personally maintain your mental health? Remember you're human and it's okay. Being human is not the worst thing in the world. It's an interesting existence certainly but just be gentle with yourself listen to your body listen to your mind because they're always going to tell you the truth i think um don't be ashamed don't be ashamed of taking medication don't be ashamed of going to therapy um i'm on about seven different medications i go to therapy i go to psychiatry um you know, and, and that's one thing that helps me go, keep going, whether it's therapy and talking to somebody or journaling or, you know, um, like I was talking about earlier, sensory therapy, things like that. You, you find what works for you. Don't be ashamed of who you are. You would never tell somebody who had diabetes or somebody who had cancer that they should be ashamed of themselves because of their disease. Just like you should never tell somebody who has a mental illness that they should be ashamed of yourself of themselves. And that goes for Kevin, the bitch and Ambrose too. They shouldn't be telling us that either. Um, yep. But yeah. So Kels, thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, Absolutely. Like always you're, you know, it's always good to sit down and chat with my best friend on the podcast and, uh, We'll be back next week for editing. Why does it suck with our guest, Sarah Sanders, who is a editor at tea with coffee media. Um, one of our longest tenured editors. Now um, she was our fourth editing hire and she is awesome. Awesome editor. And I'm excited for her to join the podcast next week or next two weeks, bi-weekly. Yeah. Something like that. But until next time, we will catch you on the flip side of the Cook the Books podcast. I've been Tyler Wood. Well, I'm still Tyler Wodkowski. I don't know why I said I've been Tyler Wodkowski. I'm still Tyler Wodkowski, the president and publisher of Tea with Coffee Media. And this is my best friend. I'm still Kelsey Ann Lovelady, the vice president of marketing. <laughs> and until next time, see ya. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Cook the Books podcast by Tea with Coffee Media. Interested in supporting this podcast and our independent press? Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to stay updated with all the latest Tea with Coffee Media updates. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter by visiting teawithcoffee.media. Finally, visit our Patreon to get early access to the Cook the Books podcast, free access to all Tea with Coffee Media ebooks, and the chance to win cool prizes. You've been listening to the Cook the Bunk podcast with me, Tyler Witkowski. And me, Kelsey Ann Lovelady. Until, Until next, next time. time.